Hi, Jeanette DePatty with Broadcast Beat. We are here at the SIMPTI Technical Conference 2017, and I am so excited to bring you this panel discussion on Agile Hollywood. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hello. Jeanette. Hello. So I have Brian Quant here. Why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? Oh, sure. I, I'm the CTO of a company called AutoDCP, and we specialize in cloud-based production services for our industry. All right, and Nick? Yeah, I'm Nick Wortley, CEO of Bixley, and we specialize in helping uh, the production companies here automate their post-process systems, as well as integrate a lot of the different assets and tools that they're already using. Cool, and Sean? Uh, Sean Novak, uh, Executive Director of Emerging Tech. Sorry, it's a new title, so trying it's to not It's a very precise. sexy title <laughs> though, right? Em emerging Director of Emerging Tech, that sounds like very sort of bleeding edgy. It's it's uh, it certainly puts things in sort of an ambiguous territory that people tend to fund but not ask questions. I hear, man. That's the way to go. <laughs> All right. So the first question I have for you guys, and you guys can just jump in. Whoever wants to answer is, what is agile development? It's a dumb word. No. <laughs> <laughs> buzzword. Well, not so it's helpful. It's a buzzword. All the marketing what people created. What is it created. supposed to mean? Uh, so Agile to me means being responsive to a project's needs while including the consumer in that need uh, versus trying to develop a product based upon some detailed specification that, that two years from now doesn't actually meet what the consumer is. Yeah. So Agile means actually involving the customer as part of the product development. And one thing to add to that is keeping the scope of the project small enough that you can actually get it done by the when you still need it. If so you take it, so it's still technologically relevant when right. that piece is finished. If you take two years to build it, then you won't need it by the time it's finished. Yeah, it's old tech. It's old, it doesn't meet the spec. It's over budget. It just doesn't. It isn't what they wanted. And Sean, I mean, there's there's this sense too of of including the customer in the work that you do at Machinima too, right? Yeah, I mean, I would argue that uh, agile development in in sort of media is really what new media and social media is. It's everything is done in a very public, open way, and that it uses the audience feedback as a way to sort of guide and steer the projects as they grow. So, in what ways do you feel? like Hollywood is ahead of the game in terms of being agile? I mean, because there is the sense of every movie and every television show being a new business, right? So what, what ways are we ahead? And what ways are we behind the gray-haired guys in suits kind of thinking? Are, are, we, so. gonna be hold, are we being recorded right now? <laughs> yes, you're being recorded. So you have to be somewhat reasonable in your response. So, so I see, what's interesting is on productions, I've been involved in many productions, uh, providing technology to the production environment. Productions are extremely agile. They're, they're very responsive. You know, whether we're spending a million dollars a day or whether we're spending $10,000 a day, uh, they're, they're very res their time frame is so short. 15 week production type cycle or 30 week production cycle is so short they have to be responsive to the changes of what happens on set. Those areas I think are extremely agile, they know what they're doing in that world. Areas that we're having difficulty with, in my mind, um, you know, when we move out of the production space, we go into the distribution side. We don't, we don't know how to do product development uh, in the deployment side, in the distribution side. Yeah, especially competing with all the multitude of streaming systems, uh, we're constantly having to deal with the movie is produced, now how do we get it into the hands of you know, millennials and even younger than that who want to watch it on a bunch of different devices and a bunch of different platforms, which are huge undertakings, but you have to, it's, it changes every few months, right? Uh, and so dealing with getting, like you're talking about asset distribution, right. getting, getting the assets from post-production to someone's phone is complicated and still kind of a mess right now. What, what do you think, Sean? Complicated and still kind of a mess? All right, so <laughs> I, come at, I, I come at this from completely the other direction, right? Is uh -huh. that, um, so I kind of grew up uh, for my production chops within Machinima. 
Right. Um, very guerrilla style. If it's on the internet, it's free. You right. Know? Right. Why don't you, right. Why don't you tell everybody what Machinima does, just in case All some right. people don't know about your multi-billion dollar awesome company. Okay. So you know uh, YouTube celebrities. Mm -hmm. Kind of our fault. So. <laughs> Way, way back in the... Oh, wait, I'm uh, taking my fist bump back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what Machinima started was as a fan community. So we, we grew up in uh, people on the internet just being really excited about creating content and sharing it with each other. Um, and it was literally a dot-com forum when it first began like 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what what the, the original sort of investors found was that it was a way that people were using uh, using existing... Uh, technology to make new stuff. It wasn't proprietary, it's all off the shelf, and then they're creating new narratives with it, right? So as that grew, um, we you know, had a YouTube channel and we said, hey, can we include this new channel we want to start as a part of this channel? And YouTube said, sure. And then we said, can we do it you know, just whenever we want? And they said, sure. And then by the end of the year, we had like 3,500 partners in our network and became the first MCN. Um, so I kind of joined right before that. Uh, and so seeing how that space sort of progressed and grew was really interesting because early on, uh, the media really matched sort of traditional media in the way that there were very select channels I could monetize. So y people had to send their stuff in and you kind of had this curated programmed content, right? So it was very, very well known. Well, as soon as the ability for individuals to monetize in their own space became more prevalent, that sort of model broke down because people didn't have to collaborate and work with a rigid structure. They could just kind of naturally grow. Um, so what we saw was the, really the rise of the individual in that case. And so when, um, so there was a, a learning curve for anybody with more of a traditional background, which is, well, they don't play by these rules. And it's like, well, because they're in a space where they don't have rules. They, they just yeah. make it up as they go along, right? Right. Based on, so I mean, that is inherently agile, right? If you're mm -hmm. sniffing out where there's an opportunity and you're just going there, mm -hmm. that's. And it, it seems like if you're doing shows on YouTube, on the internet, you can try stuff, and if it's not working out, start over, do a different show. Right, you're not committing. Okay, we're committing to a season, twelve episodes. Well, and that really depends, right? I mean, there's very many different models of how things are done mm -hmm. on YouTube. In some cases, it's you know a couple of kids in a tent. Let's put yeah. on a show. And in some cases, it's very elaborate and there's yeah, huge yeah, budgets. And so it's it's more about the competitive space, right? Mm -hmm. So if NBC is planning its fall lineup, they're they're up against very known quantities and time slots. Right. Um, with an individual YouTube creator, you have to be better than the whole world, right? There's an infinite possibility of people who, and creators who are out there who are in very different circumstances and skill sets, et cetera. And so that's what we found is that the sort of agile approach of rapid public iteration is sort of reactive to that because the space is communal. It's not innately competitive. It's somebody's figured out how to do something better. So now you, the whole world is now aware of that approach and they adapt and change. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to sort of like set up boundaries and borders that you're protecting, like it's just, it's an unwinnable situation because if you want to build a company with a bunch of employees with insurance and uh, rent to pay and lights to keep on, you are up against a kid living at home who has that sort of adolescent, uh, energy and excitement over what they're doing in the one single thing. And so you can't compete one for one there. So you go broad, but now you're competing broadly with everybody. So it's, it's, it's just, it's more of like, it's an, an adapted system that just, it's the way the world works now because there's so much more information available to everybody at any given time. And it's not right, it's not too difficult to reverse engineer anything that somebody's done on, on YouTube, right? I mean, you can pretty much look at it and see how it's done and figure out well, they'll tell you. Yeah. Like they're excited. They're, they've, yeah. they've achieved something and they want right. to share. They want right? to share it so other people can. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. like how, how many of us actually use YouTube to learn how to do another another gig or another another item. It's just. Well, I know you use YouTube all, to all learn time. how to rebuild the house. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 the thing that I, I love about what's happening is you know we use the words like we've democrat. Technology has become democratized. You know we we now the cost of the technology, the cost of 
the systems that we're using right now here today are completely approachable by by most people today and the quality, the visual quality, the cinematography quality, uh, the idea quality that is coming out of out of these out of the YouTube market, out of others in the industry is just incredible. And I, I think there's a challenge today that one of the challenges that I see today is we have to build business models that are two years out, five years out, that are actually planned, but then these are all being, and I hate to use words like this, but these are disruptive ideas. That they're, they're really forcing us uh, to be creative, to come up with new ideas and how, how we're actually going to make money in the future, or create a business for ourselves in the future. So how is the entertainment industry using customer data? I mean, what are some of the different ways that data is being used and being analyzed to help create better products in the entertainment industry? I mean, a classic example is all the Netflix shows, right? So uh, they, when they came out with House of Cards, they said that they basically ran data on their on their customers and found that they really like Kevin Spacey movies and they really like, I forget the director's name of House of Cards, but they really liked his stuff. And their big data analytics found that. So they're like, let's make a show with Kevin Spacey and that director. Now granted, the show was good on its own right, but it specifically resonated with Netflix subscribers. And then they were like, we might be onto something. And now <laughs> Netflix has countless original shows because they were able to analyze their own viewing habits, mm -hmm. which is actually really nice, when you're t especially YouTube, the analytics platforms that you get on internet-based services is out of control. Like, you can, you can view like, down to like what that person was doing 20 minutes before they watched your show. You know, like, It's really kind of crazy. It's be, it, do you think that those analytics are beyond most people's capabilities to interpret or use in a meaningful way, or are they, are they Well, that's natural? like, so that's, that's the, the new opportunity, right? It's moving, it, I always like to hear the story of how Excel came to be, right? It literally used to be people writing in boxes, and it mm -hmm. was like roomfuls of people doing it, and that when, when uh, Excel first launched as a product, that you had accountants that would literally sit on their projects for three days because it was so fast to update and something that used to take a week <laughs> that they thought that people would see it as fraud, right? Uh, okay. So what then became the new sort of opportunity wasn't people that knew how to do math in a box, it was people that knew how to use that whole system and program. One of the, uh, Machinima was acquired by Warner Brothers at the start of the year and one of the main reasons why was our business intelligence team because we have our, we have a whole group of people, and you know, BI in, in, in this context has really only existed in like the last five years. Right. Yeah. Uh, they are able to read those chicken bones, right? They're, 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 their wizardry is interpreting those trends in data. Um, and even that's tricky because you can, you have different windows to look into. I mean, anything's easy to sort of tease out data retrospectively, right? You know, you can look at all the weirdness and foibles of human history and, and pick out the weird things that lead to an event, you know? Yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. Yeah. You can also make guesses at the moment. This is why this is working. We're seeing all these trends. But then it's that next step that is, that's the trick, right? Where does this go? What does this mean? Where are we headed? Um, Machinima tried binge watching at one point after Netflix's success. We go, great, we're going to dump the videos all at once. That platform switch, all the data to that point said, this is, the, this is a way to go. It didn't work. Different platform doesn't work. It's more about consistency repetition. Yeah. Especially with the fact that YouTube has algorithms that either bury your stuff or bring it right to the top. Right. Netflix can promote their own things. The home page, House of Cards, is sitting right there. If you dump 10 videos on YouTube, well, a couple of them might come up, and then other ones just get buried, because YouTube does not like content drops. You know, it likes the trickle. Yeah, they like people coming back, but also to that point now, those big chunks of data are now also less and less available, right? Like, they're living behind big walls. Nobody knows what Google's algorithm yeah. is, yeah. you know? Except for, and I, I bet you, like, not even all of Google, like, knows what Google's algorithm it's is. It's magic. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, magic. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> so, um, in what ways do you think the Hollywood industry has, and, and the entertainment space has room to improve in terms of agile development and customer focus development? Go ahead. I will, uh, it's, so again, seeing this from somebody who came from the digital side and is now interfacing a lot with more rigid and traditional structures, um, 
the issue is is what is the it's it's almost like the concept of strategy has to be done in the speed of tactics like so it's it's understood that people like to have a well thought out plan and we all love that things go accordingly but making it so that that system adapts to things changing you know a good example is is like hey we're going to release a movie that happens to be about weather and by the way these huge natural disasters just happen right that throws a huge monkey wrench into things right there's well laid plans that fall apart yeah um so it's you almost have to make the concept of fluidity and like change the, yeah, staple like, like the, the baseline the rotten tomato score right like <laughs> yeah. that's a big issue right now of course i mean it would be better if people didn't get bad scores on rotten tomatoes because yeah. they make good films like that would be ideal but yeah. i think for an opening weekend exploratory kind of viewer a really bad rotten tomato score can really tank your first oh, yeah. weekend so now now a lot of studios are making new decisions about when they release things to be reviewed and how they manage that yeah. whole process so that the looky loos have already seen before the right so i mean there's a lot of responding to not just uh viewers but just critics and other people i mean everybody with you know 10 fingers and a keyboard is a critic right yeah. i mean for pretty much anything you can think of so uh is there some sort of Venn diagram that you guys see where software development and entertainment development, where are they intersecting and what are they learning from each other? So where are they intersecting? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's something that has, in my mind, changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. The bottom line, if you, uh, again, I don't know what I want to say so I don't get in trouble here, but uh, I, I it's you inevitable. Have, Just embrace. You have to have engineer. You need to start to invest today on the engineering as part of the actual environment that you're now working in. Engineering is no longer software engineering. I'm not. I'm not talking just video engineering and that kind of stuff. Software engineering needs to be part. Needs to be allocated budget. Needs to be actually part of the entire plan from the get-go today. These are. You don't deploy. A movie today without a serious software engineering group, you don't deploy a television episode or, or anything today without some type of serious relationship with IT and software engineering. Um, a lot of the systems that are being deployed, everything from media asset management to, oh God, uh, the new VFX project that uh, is actually going to be deployed in whichever application out there. Um, it's all software. It, it, it really is it's become embedded in our systems or in our world today, all the way from production, all the way through post, even distribution. And when you simply add the fact that we're working with insanely high resolutions across, you know, with, with petabytes, new, petabytes, petabytes, which is like a word most people like, you know, we got gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes for one movie. Right. Like you can't, you're, we're sending huge hard drives back and forth because it's our internet speeds aren't fast enough you know or, it's getting insane <laughs> or one of the one of the things that's interesting you know when we talk about AR VR and things of that nature um, we have all these creative tools that allow us to create the environments that are really awesome cool and, and moving our world um, but you still need a solid IT group engineering group mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'll use the word deployment again to allow you to repackage this stuff to deploy it under iOS, to deploy it under Android, to deploy it into the Windows environment. And those are serious, heavy investment dollars that are necessary to get these things into the into the world out there. Yeah. Plus the creative feedback that comes back as a result of that. And then so, you, when you get into you know new formats coming out like HDR and VR, right? Those are the next step in entirely different directions. One is you know huge color space with all this cool stuff, and the other is two slightly different screens that are shoved onto your face. Like, right. way different, same movie, entirely different experience with a ton of technology in the middle. Right, so. and, and when you're talking about VR, you're talking about, you know, relatively high resolution files, but during your shoot, maybe you have 16 of them coming in simultaneously. And yeah. the data, yeah, and I like, the and data load. One of the reasons I love this, this panel today, um, we kind of, the, the three of us, you know, we sit in similar background. You sit more on the creative side. You sit more on the actual creating the content and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it really is the collaboration uh, between these two groups 
uh, that finally create the experience, the you know all the systems that are being deployed into the field, the the, the talk back from the consumer actually going into the application, all all that stuff is created as a result of the collaboration of these two people. John, you want to jump I in on awesome. that? I mean, we society as a whole is built on layers of effort and tools and learning over time, and. Um, you know, software versus hardware is a question of artists versus his tool brushes, you know. A lot of what's being created now is built because engineers built it. Uh, you know, the only reason why a 16 year old kid can uh, become a YouTube millionaire yeah, from his great. phone <laughs> is because cool? of literal rocket scientists who put <laughs> geosynchronous satellites in space, you yep. know. Love open source. Right. <laughs> so it's, there's, it's, there's always going to be that collection of people that come together to the final product and it, it's, it, I wouldn't even say it's necessarily like a really a Venn diagram. It's, it's all one thing, you know. That's it. The it, it really is just taking care of the hard things that we don't want to do, so we can be more creative. Right. So, uh, from that standpoint, I mean, do you have any recommended best practices for our, our viewers out there? Like, just tell me, like, what would you tell? Fail somebody? fast. Fail fast. That's your. Yeah. Well, fail fast and learn. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't fail, fail fast, fast and blame move on to a new client. No, never mind. Fail <laughs> fast, blame the client. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good part. I like. I really like Google's right? fail fast. I yeah. really like that. I've I've I have worked in environments where people have embraced half of that. Right. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, to that point is like, it's it's changed the part of the plan, right? Like, it's if you got to be okay with learning. One thing that one of the sort of practices we've Im implemented so, internally is that you. You have to include the audience in your decision making, but they have they represent one seat at the table. So their voice can't be disproportionate to a creative vision that is driving something as well. So it should inform, but it shouldn't be reactive and fearful. And right. you'll see a lot of times people will get stymied with that, like, oh, we don't want to piss off the internet. It's like, well, they're going to get pissed off over yeah. something, right? That <laughs> Someone's like... going to be angry about something. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, it's right. pretty think... much an impossibility not to piss off the internet. Of course. Right. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it gets it gets discussion going, you know? Yeah. Sometimes they need to be upset. But, but, oh, oh, go ahead. Man. I was going to say, just kind of jumping off of what, what Brian was saying is, a lot of times there's kind of been this joke about like the engineers are in the back room and the, the designers or the creators are coming up with the ideas and the engineers groan like, oh gosh, like I have to go support that now. That's a crazy idea. That's bad because if the engineers are always kind of like begrudgingly supporting the designers and the, the creative people are always mad that the engineers are pessimists, it's like, you no, know, we need to be on the same team because right. the right. engineers can be creative by making these seemingly ridiculous things possible so the creative people can actually do the next cool experience. And they need to be working together, not at odds constantly. I've, act I've actually worked with several artists um, and it's, I, I kind of approach, uh, the way I like to summarize that is I kind of like to say, you tell me what you want to do that's really cool. I tell you that I've already built something really cool in the, in the product that you haven't actually started to deploy. So it's like it creates a little, a little bit of tension slash creativity between both groups. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at, um, I'll, I'll use Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, and it, it goes into this concept of Renaissance people. Mm -hmm. And today we have built experts in specific areas. We're all we're we're masters of computer science. We're masters of you know creativity or whatever. But we don't have a lot of Renaissance people together. So. What I really love to do is, can we throw teams together that become a renaissance team? Mm -hmm. that, that's an awesome power that I, I really like to encourage. And, and I think that's a really good point. And, and also to your point, you were talking about fear. I mean, how do you manage that fear, right? Because that fear is, it, 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 fear is the mind killer, right? Yeah. Right. But that's a, it's, it's how does that represent, like, that's not a unique manifestation in this space. No. I mean, their kids these days have been around since the dawn of old people, right? Like, and and just as much is there, you know, just as much as that sort of perception of an out of date generation exists as well. Like, that is just sort of a nature of how things are. I mean, big band music was the devil's music at one point, right? And you know, and then and then uh, you know, movies, television, video games, everything has taken its turn of what's like ruining youth these days. So then the internet is sort of in that place too, where people kind of treat it as like this a big, massive en entity, but 
it really is still a bunch of individual people. And you just have to sort of understand that that opinion isn't new, it's just heard. And it's, it's sort of one of those things that like, if you are in a community, there's always going to be different parts of it. And as human beings, if we are right. better about communicating with the parts of it that doesn't work well, then the whole system works better. It's, it's when we shut down the communication and separate that you that they become villains and this evil sort of boogeyman, right? And when you have when you're sitting in a room full of you know executives who literally you know I don't know what the Twitter is I you know whenever they put the word the in front of whatever <laughs> oh, they're yeah, describing, that's a yep. you know that the it's YouTube. like the problem there isn't that they don't understand the problem is that they don't want to. Right. So it's it, that's really what it is is an intent to understand and trying to figure it out so we can get to that place of saying okay I get where you're coming from you're totally wrong but I see how you got there and I'm going to make this decision from there. And to, to highlight on the, the, the dissent from the internet, um, a lot of times you're, you're dealing with the vocal minority. Not always, but sometimes like the people who are, who, you know, the 1% the that really dislikes your movie, really dislikes it. And they have platforms to express their dissent very loudly. Um, so you need to, but you gotta understand like, okay, is that truly a majority? Like, did you make something that isn't good? Or, did you upset a very small subset that maybe wasn't even your target market to begin with? And that takes talent to understand you're getting feedback and should you care or not? And that's not necessarily easy. <laughs> and sort of tying it back too is that's where it, it, like analytics and data comes in. Right. Because you may have a, you know, a video full of just vitriol comments but that may be proportionally low to the millions and millions of viewers watching it who are just showing up and leaving quietly. I know yeah. Jeanette can actually speak to a lot of that. Yeah, I've, 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 I've got my haters. <laughs> i got my haters. That's a sign of, that's a badge of honor in this right. business, I think. Right. Well, I hate to shut down communications because we've been talking about not shutting down communications, <laughs> but we, we are an internet culture and we are all out of time. So I want to thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Nick and Sean for being with us here today and for having such a great conversation. This is Jeanette Patty with Broadcast Beat at Simpty 27 Technical Conference.